Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, today we got a great vocalist on the show We're with Tony Lindsay. Um, he's most well known for working with Carlos Santana's band, but and he's been the longest tenured sin singer with Santana. He's got a really good voice, man. You listen to this guy, he's like old school, you know, makes you feel something when he opens his mouth, man. A uh, couple of quick announcements. I want to thank our mutual friend, Ed Roth, for hooking us up. Ed, thank you, brother. And yeah. uh, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the audio and video. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and the little uh, icon, a little emoji looks like a bell that helps us out and gets us a little more visibility with YouTube. All right, quick on Tony Lindsay, vocalist, and he's the longest tenured lead singer of Santana. Joined the band initially in 91, and he performed with Carlos from 95 to 2015 and subsequent to that as well, uh, which is the period of greatest success for the band. They released Supernatural, and they won 11 Grammy Awards, and Tony's performed on, I think, 11 Santana albums. Uh, that particular album, by the way, sold 30 million copies, and Tony sang on five of the album's tracks. Is that right? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, 30 million. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a relic to hear that. I even. know. Uh, he's also collaborated and performed with artists including Tevin Campbell, the OJs, Al Jarreau, Steve Winwood, Steve Winwood, Johnny Gill, Teddy Pendergrass, Aretha Franklin, and Lou Rawls. He's performed a duet, a duet, but I always screw that a duet with Angela Bofill and the New York Philharmonic Orchestra at New York's Avery Fisher Hall. And his voice can also be heard on major TV commercials and cartoons. On top of that, Tony's released six solo records, including his last one called Something Beautiful. And it is a beautiful record, man. This guy's got, a, like I said, a great voice. He's had two singles reach number one on the official indie soul chart. He's got a new single out called All Is One and a new jazz album out that he did with the Michael O'Neill Quintet. We'll talk about all this as we get into this. Man, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, yeah, man. Hey, thanks. We gotta, I gotta, I'm going to have to call Ed and thank him for hooking us up. Good idea. <laughs> uh, you grew up in Kingston. That is not Kingston, New York. That is not a particularly big music town. I was not curious. <laughs> yeah, man. I was, I was curious. How did you get into music and when did you first start singing professionally? Actually, I was uh, seven years old when I started. But you know, uh, Kingston's not a big music town, but Woodstock is right next to me. Eight miles from uh, my hometown is Woodstock. I didn't realize it was that close. Okay. Oh, yeah. And there was a whole lot of matter of fact, there's a lot of uh, great musicians that that still live there in Woodstock. Yes. Um, you know, Todd, Todd Rudgren and all those guys used to be hanging around there all the time. And um, uh, 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 I can't think of the drummer's name, not Jazz Cat still lives there. Um, but uh, Simon and Garfunkel, all, all those kind of guys, they were all right around in that area. That's yeah, that was a big leave on helm and the band, all those. Guys yeah, too. yeah, exactly. So you would go into Woodstock for the music to get nourished? Um, not really. I mean, I go. To, we'd go there to you know check check out some stuff sometime. But I I was in the uh, 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 me and three of my buddies that I grew up with. One of them was my cousin. You know, we used to be out on the street corners and stuff singing. Man, on really? Oh yeah. When I was I was the youngest one out of out of the four of us. We had a group called Four of a Kind, and. Um, me and uh, Steve Riddick was uh, one of the other guys. He, we're the only two that continued to uh, stay in music and do stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, this was back in, God, late 60s, mm -hmm. early 70s. We were doing stuff. And we had, uh, you know, of course, that was back in the time with the big singing groups like uh, The Temptations and, you know, The Beatles were popular. So we used to do all kinds of stuff. We'd do Motown stuff. We'd do Beatles stuff. We did some, San it's funny, we did Santana stuff and I was the one that would be singing the Santana stuff. That is funny, man. And didn't even, didn't even, you know, years later, I made, didn't make any connection with the stuff. Matter of fact, I even forgot we used to do the Santana stuff back then. That's wild how that works out sometimes, isn't it? Isn't that crazy? And it, it is. came around full circle. How'd you get into music? Did you come from a musical family? Everybody in my family is just, the, uh, I got, especially, I mean, I got some, I have some nephews that are some unbelievable musicians. Not only are they unbelievable musicians, but these guys, a couple of them are doctors and all that. <laughs> and these guys can play instruments like you won't believe. You know, so my family, my mom was uh, singing in the church all the time and, yeah, everybody, uh, pretty much in my family had some uh, musical ability. 
So they were all supportive. Your family was supportive of you and your yeah. career. Yeah. That's really cool. You know, it was uh, funny because we were doing a, a Zoom call with uh, family members. We've been doing that because we're all spread out. Some of them still back east and everywhere. And the last time we did a Zoom call was uh, they wanted to ask one of my older brothers a lot of questions because he had a singing group and all of that stuff. And and somebody asked him how, you know, how my, how our mother was with uh, him. And she, he said, well, you know, um, she she kind of didn't didn't discourage me but at the same time she wanted me to uh you know have something else that i could fall back on because the music thing wasn't uh you know all no guarantee that 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 and you know he said and i and i kind of went in a different direction I, I did the music thing for a while and then i went on and you know got a regular job and i'm sitting there thinking about it i'm going hmm maybe that's why she didn't uh she didn't uh, kind of discourage me from doing what I wanted to do because he stopped and did something different. Right. You right. Know? Right. And then when she seen the success that I had, she was, she probably was probably thinking, well, you know what? I should have let Ronnie go ahead and do his thing too. But yes. Right, man. You know, you see, well, he, my parents never stood in the way and they always knew where I was at because we, we went to school, came home, we did our homework and, and then we went to practice, man. We were, we we were practicing singing every night. That's so cool, man. And I don't every think that night. happens anymore too much. Yeah, we loved it, man. Very cool, man. Uh, at a certain point, you left New York and you moved out to Northern California. I was curious what prompted that move, and once you got to California, what'd you do for work? Well, uh, New York, uh, as you know, since you you're from there too, New York is in the winter time is extremely cold. <laughs> Brutal, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I was, I was at the time going to school at Albany State University up in Albany. Sure. And you think, well, you, you were down in the city, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, the, the difference between New York City temperature and Albany, New York. Oh, it, it's freezing up there, man. Man, it was so cold. And I was, you know what? Uh, if people want to live in this kind of thing for the rest of their lives, they can do it. But I'm getting out of here. And the weather is pretty much what prompted me to, to, to get out of New York and come west. You know, I had a, I had a few uh, places on, on my list. And I always tell the story about that. I went down to, because uh, uh, one of my older brothers lives, and I had a lot of family that still live down in Raleigh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So I go down to Raleigh, and I was going to spend two weeks in, uh, in each place just to get a feel. So I had... Uh, Raleigh, Washington, D.C., and Atlanta, Georgia were the three on my list, and California was last. So I go down to visit my brother, and he had just moved down there, and uh, we were working for IBM, and IBM location was outside of uh, town, uh, outside of the city of Raleigh, a place called Research Triangle is where they built all of the, all the high-tech stuff. So it was, you know, fairly new development, and I, I get to his house, and wake up the next day, a nice day, and I said, hey, man, uh, you know, I want to, you know, take a walk. I said, is there a, a store or something around that I can go to? So he said, yeah, uh, about a mile, a little over a mile down the road, they, they got a new little shopping center they're building. So I walk down there. I get down there, and I go in the store, and I pick up a few items, get to the counter, and I'm telling you, there was a uh, uh, – a white lady in front, black lady in back of her. There's a white guy in front of me. So the cashier waits on the lady in front. And then when it came to the black lady, she looked right past, looked right past her and went to the guy that was standing in front of me. God, and when, when she did that, I took all the stuff I had. I pushed it on the counter. <laughs> I walked out of the store, went back to my brother's house. I got on the phone to the airline. And I'm like, hey, um, you know, I I know I booked my ticket for to, to leave two weeks from now, but can I change that so I can leave sometime tomorrow? And they said, sure, no problem. And my brother's hearing me have this conversation, so he goes, hey man, I thought you were going to stay for two weeks to check it out. I said, let me let me tell you something, man. I said, if you want to stay here, you can. But what I just saw happen at the store, if I stay down here, they're going to have me hanging from a tree, and I'm getting out of here because I'm not going to. Who is this, man? 
I said, I'm not going to put up with that. So I got back to Albany. I took Atlanta. <laughs> I took Washington, D.C. off the list. I called my buddy that lived out here in California. I said, hey, could you check with your family to see if I can, uh, you know, come out and, and stay with you guys till I get on my feet? He called me back like five seconds later. He said, hey, my mom and dad said, bring it. So from that point on, I started saving my money again. I shipped everything I had on UPS out to California, and that was it. Never turned back. What year was this? Uh, I got here in 1980. I arrived in the Bay Area. Yeah. Man, that is... Uh, I was 25 years old, man. That's incredible that that was going on in 1980. But it yeah. was the South. You know, because it's in New York City. You couldn't... That, that never happened. No. None of that stuff all. happened. No. And you know what? I probably would have... Uh, if, if New York had better weather, I probably would have stayed there because everything is in New York City. The same sure. guy. You know, it probably even more in New York City than it is in in, in, in uh, Los Angeles, yeah. or and definitely more than which in San Francisco. Yes, but yeah. um, I probably would have stayed there if the weather was better. But things happen for a reason, and hey, I I, uh, I actually have, uh, accomplished more than even more than the dream that I had. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I've gone past that. So, so in nineteen, you were how old were you then? Uh, 80 in 1980, I moved out here. I was just, just turned to 25. Man, so that took a lot of um, courage you better to like, believe move across the country like I that. I came man, out by myself, kid. too. Yeah, that took a lot. And my mom, was she was terrified, you know, going that far away from home. Yeah. I said, you know what? If I, if I do my absolute worst and have to live on the street, at least I'll be warm. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't going to let that happen anyway. You know, if, yeah. if things started turning, turning to the worst, I would have figured out a way to save enough money to buy myself a plane ticket and, and go on back. Sure. Man. You know, cause back then plane tickets and all that, they weren't, they weren't that nowhere near as the amount mm -hmm. of money they cost now. Wow. What, and I'm assuming you haven't encountered, you didn't have any of that. There was no racism that you had to deal with in California. Um, there, there, there's some out here, you know, it's actually getting worse now, you know, with all of this uh, stuff going on that, you know, it's definitely getting worse because uh, right now uh, people that have these d d deep rooted feelings feel like they have a, a leader that they, they can, they can express themselves now and people are doing it. And, you know, you'd be surprised, man, uh, the, uh, this COVID thing and, 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 and just the way our president is, you know, there's some friends of mine that uh, I have to take a look, a second look at a lot of people like, wow, you really think like that? Because this stuff is starting to come out and it's, it's pretty scary and it's, and it's, and it's really disappointing, but you know what? It's something that we're just going to have to deal with and, and try to move forward and, and get the best out of it right now. And that's all we can do. Man, I don't even know what to say to that. Like, I'm sorry that anybody has to deal with that, but it's, it's, uh, but yeah, I've been I've been through a, a couple of little things out here. We're, they weren't they weren't as bad as they could have been, you know. But you know, hey man, people are people. You know, you we it, it, it's so funny. You watch watch little kids play. Yeah, they don't even it don't even matter. Kids right. they they don't see any of that stuff. You know, the parents are the ones that instill all that crazy, those crazy thoughts into their kids' system. You yeah. just let let the kids go on and play and be themselves. As a, my mom, you know, I, I tell the story all the time, man. When I was coming up, you know, we always had people in our house I, sitting down at the table next to me. I didn't even know who the heck they were. And it didn't <laughs> matter what color, white, black, or whatever. And I was like, well, who is this? You know, we'd introduce her. And they, my mother said, hey, he was, he was hungry. And I told him to come on in and get some food. Sit down. That's yeah, the way man. it was. I know. I I, I I don't really say much about this because I haven't experienced it to be, you know, how could I, right? I'm a white dude. I haven't experienced racism. So, but I, it's just kind of sickening just to hear shit like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something that I, it's, it's never going to go away. You know, we just have to deal with it. And I'm, I'm actually really happy that I do live in California because, you know, it's definitely a, a lot better out here than it is a lot of places. You get into the middle of the country, boy. And in and in a lot of the South, you really got some problems. I don't know how they do it, man. <laughs> but I will say this: uh, at least in those places, they 
they're really blatant about it and they let you know straight up if they don't like you. It ain't no beating around the bush about it, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, which at least you know to stay the hell away, which is great. Yeah. Who the hell wants to enter a place like that? Yeah. Man, I'm sorry you got to deal with this shit, man. I've talked yeah. to lots of guys on the show that have had similar experiences. It's just, you know, not, I don't, I don't get it. Hey, man, you know what? I just, I just live the life of uh, be nice to people and hopefully you'll get that back from them. Right. That's, that's all, all I, that's right. all you can do. Yeah. Wow. You know? Yeah, I've had guys come on the show and they'll say like, it's not overt, but like they'll walk in an elevator and they'll see someone like clutch their purse. <laughs> yeah. was, was something like that. <laughs> and he's just like a regular guy like you and me. He's just like, like, oh, yeah. he's like a middle-aged guy. You know, he's not like a homeless person, you know, or, or a, a, a drug addict, you know. But like I hear oh, stuff yeah. like that. And, and you know, you're, walking, you're walking, walking down the street and then all of a sudden you see people cross to the other <laughs> side of the street. So they, all, all that kind of stuff happens, man. And I'm sorry, man. And you know, I mean, I've I've heard of a lot of people, that especially interracial couples, that they walk into a restaurant and people look at them all weird and you know give them a weird vibe and that stuff is it, it, never going to go away, man. Never. You know, so we just have to, you know, try to find the best of it and move on. That's all you can yeah. do. That's why I, I stay in music. Yeah, man. Because. I can, somebody, somebody may not like me, but they'll be out there listening to the music anyway. Oh, hell yeah, man. <laughs> long as, uh, long as they buy my CD, I'm cool. <laughs> when, once you got to California, were there any like cultural adjustments you had to make from living upstate New York to California? Not at all. None. Okay. I mean, it was like, you know, I, I felt like I belonged here from day one, man. You know, the weather, uh, the people, it, it was just, it's weird. It just it really haven't felt any of this weird racial vibe or tension until the, the last four years. Actually, it's got really gotten bad. Yeah. But before that, it wasn't that bad at all. But now, it's just it's just strange. I don't. It's it, it, it's really disappointing because I really don't. Right now, I don't know what this country is. I mean, I'm confused right now. And I thought the, the, the I can't even call it the United States anymore because right now we're not united at all. No, man, that, that is a problem. I mean, it's just the 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 ununited uh, states. <laughs> the ununited states of America. <laughs> Hopefully, it's going to change so one way or the other. It's got to get better. Man, you know? I hope so. If, if there's a lot bigger problems that people should be focusing on. Yeah, the color of someone's skin, man. That's like you know, there's a lot of shit we got to deal with, man. Yeah, so it's uh, we just keep on, we keep on playing the music, man. That's it. Uh, what did you do for work when you first got to Cali? Like, how'd you start I was getting working gigs? At, uh, at a, a couple of men's clothing stores while I was uh running around trying to you know meet people and and uh, uh it took me about. Hmm. I would say close to probably about six or seven months before I started, you know, meeting, meeting a, a lot of really good musicians and going out and sitting, sitting in with them. And then all of a sudden I'm find myself in a couple bands and that was it. And I was working at some men's, men's clothing stores because uh, I could either, either get the clothes for free or get them so cheap that they might as well be free. Sure, sure. Because you had to look good on stage too, you know. Right, absolutely. I was out hustling. I was out every night, every night of the week I was out. Even when I was I was just going looking for stuff and even when I did find a find a job. After I finished work, I hit the streets cuz out here there was a lot of music, live music in the in the Bay Area. Oh god, the music yeah. scene up here, clubs for days. And and it's still uh, kind of better that way, you know. Down in Los Angeles, man, it's a whole different thing. You know, those guys down there, uh, there's not that many clubs, right? And the ones that they that they are that they have down there don't don't pay that much money, or a lot of them you have to pay to play in them. Yeah, I pay to play. That's what I hear all the time, man. Up here, you get paid. To, you, you you play at a club, you get paid to play play at the place. That's great. You know, they help you with advertising and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's fantastic. That's why I said I'm staying up here because, you know, it's 
I don't want to be working at some damn restaurant serve, uh, waiting tables, you know, trying to, trying to get that break. I want to be able to play and, 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 you know, sharpen up my, my chops and all of that kind of stuff, you know? So work with, I was working with clubs up here before the pandemic hit. If I wanted to work five or six nights a week, no problem. That's awesome. Even now, that's awesome, man. Yeah. How, I hope this is the only question I hope to ask you because that you've been asked before. I apologize. Um, how long? How did you get? This, talk about the story of how you got connected with Santana's band because I read it. It was pretty cool. Oh yeah. Well, um, I don't know if you've heard with a cast from Tower of Power. Right. Um, uh, Chester Thompson was playing. Yeah. He used to play with Tower, keyboard player, and uh, Ronnie Beck was a, a drummer in Tower of Power that had, that had replaced uh, Dave Garibaldi for a while. And Ronnie and Chester had got to be really good friends. And then um, I guess Dave decided to come back. So they let Ronnie go. Mm -hmm. And I met Ronnie Beck here because he lived in San Jose. Matter of fact, we just did a session with him a couple of days ago. Oh, that's cool. That's a long time. Yeah, long time, man. So we, uh, we had this group called Spangalang here in the Bay Area. And when... Ronnie and Chester were really good friends. So every time Chester would, Chester had left at this point, Chester had left, he left uh, Tower of Power and he was uh, out with uh, Santana okay, for a couple of years. But every time he would come home off the road, he'd call Ronnie and say, hey, what are you guys playing? And they would, he would come and hear us because he loved the group. You know, we had, we had, uh, uh, it was a five piece group and all of us, were lead singers. <laughs> so you can imagine what the vocals sound like. And yeah. You know, so it was cool. So Chester used to come and see us all the time. And this one time he came, he said, Hey, you know, uh, uh, Carlos is auditioning singers. If you, uh, you know, you want to get a shot, I'll, I'll let him know and throw your name in the pot. I said, yeah, sure. No problem. And, uh, he, he put in a, a request for an audition for me. And it was a trip too, man, because, Back then, uh, at that time, too, I was working uh, as a number one session caller with Narda Michael Walden, and I was doing a lot of uh, a lot of jingles up in Sausalito with this uh, ad agency by the name of Keller & Cohen. So at least five days a week, I'm always up in Marin County doing recording sessions with Narda and doing, doing a bunch of jingles. Making, I was making some pretty good money. I actually, yeah, I, I actually, when I took that gig, when I took the Santana gig, I actually took a cut and pay. Wow. Because all the other stuff you were doing was just, oh man, it was so prolific. I mean, yeah. You know, between me doing working gigs and, and doing all the recording sessions and the, those jingles were paying some great money. Yeah. I mean, those checks were rolling in all the time and, but I knew I had to take that gig. We, how, I had to do that. So what happened? You go to the audition. Was there a lot of guys auditioning? No, actually, uh, they, I think that they, if they did, I think they may have auditioned about 12 guys, but I never saw anybody else. When I went there, you know, they sent me, um, uh, uh, a couple tunes that, uh, to be, you know, have ready for the audition. And it just so happened that the, the day of the audition, I had a, I had a recording session scheduled at, at Narda Michael Walden's place too. And it worked out perfect because both of those guys lived in San Rafael, California. Oh man. Their studios were only a couple blocks from each other. So I went to, and, and did the audition with Santana first left there. Uh, we had about, they sent me about five songs to do. We only did two songs in the audition and Carlos said, Hey, you know, I don't need to hear anymore. So that was I, it right there. So yeah. you, you got the gig right there. Well, yeah. But I didn't know. I wasn't sure if he liked me or if he didn't like me. Oh, cause he just said, I don't need to hear anymore. Yeah. I don't need to hear oh. anymore. That was it. <laughs> oh, so, so, I, I so you left it kind of hanging like, Oh my God. Yeah. That's gotta be nerve wracking. Yeah. But you know what? I, it, it, I didn't even worry about it. As a matter yeah. of fact, I didn't think any more about it. I went to uh, do the session with Narda and we were there all day and into the night. And when I got home, there were a, a few messages on my, on my answering machine at the time from the, uh, from the um, uh, management of Santana saying, hey man, Carlos really liked you. You want the gig, it's yours, call us back. And then he, he left a couple of them because I, he didn't realize I was doing a session and uh, wasn't getting the messages. So, but wow. that's how it all went down. That's so cool. It was, and, and uh, it's nice that there was no, 
like it was right there. You know, like it, it's almost like the universe was like, yep, laid it out for you to have, sort of. You know, it was it was convenient. They're, they're like it, it literally four blocks from each other. That's amazing. Yeah, it was crazy. All right, so what were some of the challenges early on as far as adjusting from playing clubs and then you're playing in arenas with Santana? Was there any adjustments or things Actually, you had to get used to? Actually, the biggest adjustment for me was just, you know, it was a lot of stuff to learn, man. I mean, I was, I was constantly up at uh, Carlos's house, you know, you know, just me and him one-on-one, -on -one, and he was taking me through the stuff, you know, getting me ready for the rehearsals and all that. You know, and I had to, uh, eventually I had to learn stuff in Spanish. I didn't speak Spanish, you know. I was wondering that because I, I saw you on YouTube, you know, doing some prep. You were singing some Spanish songs. Yeah, I've been doing it. I, I sit down, I learn that stuff, and I can do it. Yeah. But, you know, as far as somebody starts talking and speaking to me in Spanish, I'll get, I'll get a couple words here and there to kind of <laughs> see where the conversation's going. But I'm like, for the most part, it's like, whew, yeah, straight over my head. But, yeah, the, the big stage adjustment, I didn't, you know, that was, my blood just started playing. When I walk out and you see all those people out there, I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is it. You know? <laughs> That's cool. I would go, as long as I was prepared, there was never a problem. Hit That's that good. stage, man, and I'm ready to go. Because you did the work. Exactly. Uh, where did you get that work ethic from? Because it seems like you actually come from a whole family of, of like overachievers. Yeah. Yeah. When it's, um, well, it's just, uh, e even now I, t I tell people all the time, I I'm, I'm still hungry, man. You know, I, I got the, uh, the 11 Grammys and all that kind of stuff, you know, and, uh, we're doing really well, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not out here. Don't, I know I'm not going to live in the streets and all that. And I'm, I'm working on my music. I'm putting stuff out all the time. Because all the time, man. I'm still hungry. Yeah. You know, I, I love doing this. You know, every time I write a, a, a song, I don't even know where this stuff comes from, man, because I wasn't, you know, uh, 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 trained with, you know, learning uh, how to play keyboards and all that kind of stuff. I sit down and I figured out a long time ago, whatever I'm hearing in my head, I can sit down at the, at the keyboard and figure out what the chords and stuff is behind it. And that's the way I've been going at things. And I, I don't know where this inspiration comes from. So I'm, I'm just, you know, all enthused about being able to, to do this all the time. And I'm, I'm, it's, it's cracking me up because I'm actually starting to come out with some good stuff. <laughs> I'm uh, like, wow. <laughs> where, where did the drive? I, I, I'm, I like that you said you're still hungry, man. That's. I just, I just, I just love what I do. So that's mm -hmm. where the drive is, and it's, you know, there's nobody in, in, in always sitting around telling me, man, yeah, you need to do this. It, it, that's me talking to myself, telling me I need to do it. Yeah. You know, I sit around sometimes and even all of the stuff that I'm, that I'm doing, which is, I'm doing quite a bit, but sometimes I wake up and I go, I, I, I wake up, I look around and I feel like I haven't been doing enough. It's weird. So that drive is always in there. So I'm, I'm always reaching for that, that higher branch. Yeah. You know, I always said, um, you know, uh, I pretty much, uh, uh, the people have these bucket lists, they call them. I pretty much can can take a lot of the stuff off of my bucket list. I said, there's one thing that I want that I want to get now is uh, it'd be nice to have a Grammy, just one of them with just my name on it. For your solo stuff, yeah. Just my name on it. That would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. And if I get that, it's going to be cool. But I'm I'm happy now that I'm starting to hear my stuff on the radio. That's, that's even a bigger thing for me than even getting a Grammy. Because, you know, it's like, you know... Uh, I put my the last two years, I've uh, I've been on the Grammy uh, uh, ballot for nomination. You know, I put my stuff on there and all that. But you, once you, once you start doing that kind of thing and you get your name on that ballot and you, you see the thousands of names that are on there that you're competing against, only ones that are gonna that are really gonna get something out of it. If if you're in a in a category where you're maybe doing children's music or right. something like that which is really different that are not a lot of people doing it, yeah. then you have a chance to get one. But when you're doing stuff like I'm doing uh, R and B and jazz stuff, you're competing with these major record labels who have all this money to be spending on their artists to make sure that their artists get picked to get a Grammy. You know, they pretty much pay mm -hmm. for it. 
actually, especially when you come to for Ar Arista Records and Warner Brothers, they're definitely paying for their artists to, to be nominated because, you know, that keeps money in, coming back into their record company. So sure. a guy who is independent like me, you know, I'm spending my own money on myself and I don't mind doing that because it's me that I'm spending it on. But, you know, I don't have the money to compete with. You can't with compete with that. Yeah, no, yeah, it's impossible. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, man, there, there are a lot of uh, outlets for, for independent, for indie artists now. It's really opened up a lot. I even heard on, on, on Sirius XM, they got an indie, um, an indie station on there now for indie artists. You so know, you're, you're of, hip to of, like, sorry, go ahead. I apologize. No, no, you go ahead. What were you going to say? You're hip to like, you're looking for all these opportunities out there and then you yeah. make the connection to say, Hey, give my music a shot. Exactly. Yeah. That's, you know, that's I'm working with um, this guy who, uh, who they only specialize in working with uh, indie artists. Hmm. This guy, his name is Chris Clay. As a matter of fact, he's out of, out of New York and, 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 uh, and on the East coast of North Carolina. He has a, a, a radio station on the internet called Soul Cafe Radio. And there's a whole bunch of in the, uh, uh, internet radio stations that that feature indie artists all across the world. And uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting play in the UK, which is another whole indie thing. And these guys, they're, they're reasonable as far as they're doing the marketing and getting the radio airplay for you. And, you know, if you got to... If you if you're confident enough to put your music out there, you know, and it, what I like about it, and these guys are honest too. If they don't feel that your song is gonna gonna do well, they'll tell you that. So they you don't end up spending your money on something that you know is not gonna go anywhere. Sure. But if you got something good, they put me on the hit list. They got a thing called the hit list right now. I saw that. My song uh, "All Is One" is is the first song on the hit list. That's great, Which, man. When they put it on the hit list, that means that. Sometime eventually it's it's going to go to number one, and they're moving it slow right now, which is which is okay with me because then I'm getting I'm getting more mileage out of the song when they do that. Yeah, definitely. And you know they're reasonably be priced, reasonably be priced for for indie artists, and you know I'm it, it it's so refreshing, man. It's satisfying to you know I I sign up because uh, all of these radio stations are on Twitter, so you can go on and you can follow all these stations. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, if they're playing your music, bling, a little text will show up on your Twitter thing. Oh, now that's playing cool. Tony Lindsay, that, that, that. So you can go to go to Google, pull up their radio station, sit back and hear your music play. Hear yourself oh, cool, played on the radio. Which I mean, I was over awesome. in, yeah, I'm over in Europe, man. And my Twitter thing goes off. I tune into the station. Here I am over in Europe. I'm hearing myself. That's cool, man. Anywhere Have you toured in the world, Europe? What's that again? Have you toured Europe? Oh yeah, with Santana, we shoot, man. We, we, I must have gone around the world at least twenty times with him. Yeah, minimum in those twenty-five years, and I still continue to go over. You know, uh, you heard uh, uh, Alex Lidgerwood. Oh, of singer. course, yeah, yeah. Me and, me and Alex, uh, we work with this group out of Germany. They're called the Magic of Santana. Oh, okay. So it's and like they, a cover band, a Santana cover yeah. band. And the guitar player, this dude, his name is Gerd Schluter. Uh -huh. Gerd, Gerd looks like a used car salesman. <laughs> but this dude, I'm telling you, man, <laughs> when, he, when he picks up that freaking guitar, I mean, he's, he's probably, as far as sounding like Carlos, he's probably the closest that I've heard, heard a lot of guys you know, playing to say. He's probably, he, he's dead on the, the sound and everything. That's oh, wild. Man. And the group, I mean, we work all the time. You know, we had a whole bunch of gigs scheduled for this year that, of course, had to be canceled. Of course. I know. So I've been back and forth with those guys for a couple of years now. Me and Alex do the gig together. It's it's fun because uh, me and Alex, we did, we did one Santana uh, record together, Milagro. Okay. And, but we never toured together. Oh, wow. So now you get to do that. Yep. We did that one record and we never toured together. And, and then me and him, we've been hooking up and doing the magic of Santana thing over in Europe. And That's those guys cool. cracked me up too. You Man, you know, uh, you, do you know an agent in the agent in the, uh, in the U S that we can get some gigs with <laughs> me, me and Alex would look at each other and go, nah, <laughs> we don't want to do that. 
<laughs> you know what? Let's just keep this over here. Yes, the, the the competition with Santana tribute bands in the U.S. Man, they're, they're all over the place. You know, over here, yeah, you got we got our own little market over here in Europe, and then yeah. let's just concentrate on that. That's great, man. That's good. That would be that must be a good build to have you both on the sh- on the same oh, show. Oh yeah, that'd man. be really cool. And these guys, they over there, they they get the support from these sound companies. And stuff. man, we did this. Uh, 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 promotional video and they had this huge warehouse which is this this company uh, I forgot the name of them over there but they supply all of the uh, 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 live recording uh, recording equipment and live stuff for uh, all the concerts and stuff around in Europe there's a bunch of companies out there that do this they had this huge warehouse they set up a stage with all the lighting and cameras and everything and we did probably about like five songs like we were actually doing the show had a had a little audience and everything in there, and that's how they set up to do a promotional video. This thing was really so, cool. Oh my god! I mean, it, it it was so clean and 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 everything. All the lighting. I mean, this everything was just perfect. And I'm like, there's no way that we're not going to get any gigs by, you know, these guys start they 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 send those out to the people to get get gigs around Europe, and we get hired immediately. Yeah, I'm sure. As opposed to what everybody else is sending, which is nothing. But they have these these guys have friends that that work at these companies, and, and they did that stuff. They did that set up all that set up for nothing. Didn't even ask for a dime from those guys. Oh, that was free! Wow. Yeah, that's great, man. Um, I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna uh, talk about some gigs and some artists you've worked with, Tony. If you could talk about how you got the gig. And maybe a cool or interesting story about working with them. And uh, if there's any lessons learned on any of these gigs. Uh, one is, the first one, you sang God Bless America <laughs> at the NL Championship Series for Game 4. I thought that was so cool. Isn't that, that crazy? Yeah, what, what, against, tell me what you're the feeling. St. Louis you're Cardinals talking. and the Giants. Oh. Well, I do the, um, matter of fact, I'm doing, the, uh, I'm going down to do the 49ers uh, uh, national anthem this week are you really yeah they want me to come down to the stadium i i do the, uh, the anthem for the for the 49ers the giants san jose sharks and and the uh golden state warriors holy the only, crap the only two teams in the bay area that i haven't done a national anthem or, or any of that for is the the old well the las vegas raiders now right. which i wouldn't want to do it for them now anyway right and uh the oakland a's they're the only two teams that's amazing. How did you how did you get those gigs? Like how did you get somebody I don't know one? how uh, how it all started. Somebody contacted me to do a national anthem. It was years ago and I've been doing them ever since. Yeah, this That's this so- week they had me coming down to um down to the, the 49er stadium the good there's not going to be any audience at the games. Mm-hmm. So they're going to come down so I can do it with their their film crew and everything and then it, it's going to be broadcast on the uh October 18th when they play the Rams. That is cool. I'm gonna make a note and of because I'd love to check that out. My wife recorded one right right here in in our, our dining room. Uh, guys from the Giants said, "Hey man, can you uh, do a national anthem for us? You you can just do it, you know, from wherever you're at. Use your use your phone or whatever. Just make sure you have a a, a clear background with nothing in it. And if you, you could put, you put your Giants uh, jersey on, that'd be great. So we did it right here in in our dining room, and <laughs> I uploaded it to them. And they put it on their big screen like that's, two or three times already. That's great, man. Well, it's how did crazy. how did it feel when you did like the championship series? There's a that's a packed stadium, oh, man. Packed. You know, the more the more people, the the better off. I yeah. Am. And my blood just gets pumping when I see a big crowd like that. It's like, oh yeah, let's let's do this. So you you do, you really just thrive on on that. I mean, you have good energy and because you're yeah. prepared. Yep. Yeah. So you feed off the energy of the and people. And it was interesting because that day, let me see, we had, I did God Bless America. And they had um, uh, uh, Michael Franti. He's, you know, Michael, Michael Franti's got a, a group called Spearhead. I don't know them. Sorry, probably, matter of fact, they opened up for Santana too. So he did uh, take me out to the ball game. And I forgot who was, it might have been, was it Steve Perry might have been that day that did the national anthem? So they had three oh, wow. of us there. I think it might have been Steve Perry that did the national anthem that day. 
And I did God Bless America, and Franti did take me out to the ball game. That's cool, man. And, well, we all live right here in the Bay Area. But that was a big game, man. I remember that one. Yeah, that was when they, they – actually, the Giants went on and won the World Series that year. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, I don't know if this is accurate. It's, you sang background vocals on a Curtis Mayfield record, New World oh, yeah. Order. Tell oh, me yeah. about that. What was that like? How'd you get that gig, and what was that like? Well, Nardo Michael Walton was producing the Curtis Mayfield okay. record, and we did the backgrounds for that. And we had uh, um, uh, me and a buddy, uh, Clay Tobin Richardson, and a guy, uh, Skylar, Skylar Jett, who lives over in, uh, in London now, uh, we did backgrounds on the uh, on the OJ's record. I saw that. that. That was on my list as well. So talk about those two. What was it like working with, like, Curtis, man? That guy is such a genius. Well, we never never saw him. Oh, this is studio only. Yeah, yeah we had, oh. had, had, had the tracks. But I did, uh, with, with my group Spangalang, we did open up for Curtis Mayfield up in uh, Santa Cruz at a place called The Catalyst. What year? God. That was probably what uh, era? When did he? Uh, when did he die? Well, it was it was be right before. It, it was probably about two years before he they had that accident and yeah. in Central Park where the lighting fell down on him and, and paralyzed him. Was that like in the nineties, early nineties? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it had to be in the nineties. Yeah, we opened up for him in, at the place called the Catalyst up in Santa Cruz, and that was that was pretty dang cool, man. Dude, what was that like? That guy is a freaking. Oh. Just so, so talented, man. Yeah, that was fun. And then to be able to sing background on a record, and I think that might have been the last last record that he uh, had done. It was his last died. record, yeah. New World Order, it was. Yeah. And, we, and then the, when we did the, uh, when me and uh, Clay and uh, Skyler did the backgrounds for the OJs, we, we called ourselves the Blow Jays. That's what <laughs> <laughs> they had to give us credit for it, too, because they, they never took us off. So, the uh, Blow Jays. Yeah, That's we so call funny. ourselves the Blow Jays. What was it like working with those guys? Were they in the studio or no? See, we didn't see them either. We oh, just, okay. They sent the tracks. We did the backgrounds, and then uh, Anarda had them come in to do their leads. Uh, Steve Winwood. What'd you do with Steve? Um, that was uh, 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 with Steve was more live stuff. Matter of fact, it was with uh, uh, Steve Woodward and Stevie Wonder. Oh wow! Anarda, Michael. Well, we did. Uh, it was a TV show that we did. Um, what was the name of that thing? There was a bunch of us there, man. I think Prince was on that show. Uh, Steve Winwood, Narda, because I, I was there with Narda doing stuff. And we were backing up George Michael. And we backed up, uh, um, who else did we back up? There were a few people on that show, man. That was a, such a long time ago. But then uh, Steve Winwood, uh, we, we did a Santana tour with Steve Winwood's band too. Dude, I saw that show. Uh, yeah. Steve opened up for Carlos. Yeah. Yeah, man. That was that, yeah, that was, was pretty cool. In the uh, that was a, my daughter was it was she was probably in the early two thousand somewhere like two thousand five yeah. six or something like that. Yeah. See, the the the, the years just you know <laughs> I'm I, sure I, I can remember some of the some of the situations and all, but what year it was is kind of like it goes yeah. right past me. I'm sure, man. But yeah, that was a good show. It was a really good show. It was Steve. Oh yeah, Carlos. Um, hey man, we had a we had a lot of good. I'm gonna tell you the one, I think one of the one of the best Santana tours we did was with. Um, uh, hey Tony, back up one inch because I want. Your, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you, you, even halfway between where you were, I just want to see your whole face. Yeah, yeah, you. Uh, yeah, you got a great smile, man. We need to see that. Yeah, a group called Oza Motley. Mm -hmm. They were out of L.A. Yeah, Oza Motley opened up, and then uh, you heard the group called Manal from. Uh, yeah, from uh, Latin Latin guy. Yes. Yeah. They, I know they, called, uh, they were calling themselves actually the um the uh, uh Latin police because they kind of had that vibe. Yep. But that that one year we had uh, Oza Motley, Santana and and uh and Mana. Yeah. And that was probably one of the best Santana tours that we did. So we would switch off cuz Mana was pretty popular too. I think they're the largest Latin uh, artist yeah. history of Latin music, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So one night we would we would close, and then the next night they would close, and you know we'd flip back and forth. But Oza Motley was always the opening act, and I'm gonna tell you, man, that, that tour was great. There was a party every night because the guys in Oza Motley, after after they finished their show, they were in the dressing room recording their next record. <laughs> they had the um, um, 
who was the company that came out with that that uh, a digital box that you can actually record stuff? Um, was it made by Roland? There's a lot of them. There's a- yeah, but they had that 16 track. I think it was a Roland thing that they had that you can you can record right into it. And those guys, matter of fact, uh, uh, Victor Wooten had one of those too because he did he did one of his records on that thing. On oh, the same thing, and okay. They would have they would have it set up in their dressing room every night. So they were in there recording stuff, and then after that, they they'd have a DJ, they'd have one of the guys set up a, a little DJ thing, and they'd be blasting music out of their uh, out of the dressing rooms every night. That's cool, man. So it was a good tour. Oh, it was great. Even even Carlos was started hanging out at, at a couple of the, uh, you know, he would usually take off and go to the hotel. Yeah. But every time he heard his man, Oza Motley, boy, they were killing it at the little party they had in their dressing room there. He went, what? What are you guys talking about? So then he started going to a couple of them like, wow. That's funny, <laughs> man. These guys are having fun, man. That's great, man. Uh, man, you have a, I was really impressed. Your catalog for like a, a solo vocalist is big. You, you've put out a lot of records, man. Hey, I'm still, my, my new, actually my, my new record is, uh, I, all my demos are done. I'm I'm just waiting for my my producer Randy Yamada. I'm waiting for him for his schedule to free up a tiny bit so so he can get started on uh, so the song All Is One. Uh, uh, me and Randy wrote that one together, and I said, "Hey man, we have to get this out right now." Okay, I was now, wondering where that was from. Okay, so it's yeah. on to be so released while he's uh, while he's working on the other stuff to put out. I said we put All Is One out right now, and I can get I can get that to last right through December. Great. So I'm hoping he's going to be done with uh, produ- getting the production done on my stuff. Because I'm, uh, you know, I keep sending him, sending files and stuff down to him. I don't, I don't want to bombard him too much with stuff, you know, but he's got like four of the songs and I got, I still got quite a few more to send down to him. So were you always writing? Like yeah. when did you start writing? I mean, guys, I'm just shocked how big a catalog you have. That's not, I mean, that's I haven't, I've had almost 800 people on this show you're a vocalist and you got six to be seven records. That's, that, yeah. that's not unheard. It's unheard of. Well, my, my, my buddy, Myron, Myron Dove, who is also a Ed Ross buddy. He, he had convinced me and, and told me back when we had, uh, cause we used to record a lot of stuff at his house and I didn't have any recording set up. And he says, man, you, you need to start buying this stuff and, and learning how to, you know, a run a run a sequencer and record stuff and he says he says because you can do this he said if you start doing this you're going to be able to you know record all your stuff whenever you want to you have your own setup and uh, he convinced me that i remember the first keyboard that i bought was made by insonic mm-hmm. you remember that company in sonic <laughs> no i know well, what was they the deal this, with them they had this keyboard that was a uh, 88 keys it had a bunch of sounds in it, drum sounds, keyboard sounds and all, and it had a sequencer built in it. That That's how I learned how to how to sequence. Okay. And then I started buying a whole bunch of other stuff, and next thing you know, I got all this equipment and got my own uh, space. And I, my my studio, I just use it. You know, people are calling me all day, man, you know, you, do you do sessions? As a, I got it for my own writing purposes. That's it. Yeah. Because I want to continue to write songs and – you know, a lot of cats, man, I like to come up, man, we'd write a song. I, no, I don't want nobody in my space with me. <laughs> really? So you write most of your stuff on your own? Yep. And the, the way I do a lot of stuff with Randy is I, I, I'll come up with the idea and I'll develop it as much as I can. And if I need his help with it, I just send it down to him. Okay. And he'll do it or he'll send me stuff and say, hey, man, what do you think about this? And I'll go ahead and, and, and uh, finish working on the idea and then finish developing but I want to I want to have that space for myself. Everybody needs to have their own space. Yeah. Because the minute you get in there and you start renting studio time out to cats, and that money starts coming in, you get used to that kind of thing. And then you got you got people around in your studio all the time, and you'll never get any of your stuff done. Yeah. Well, that's a big commitment on your end, man. It's just like indicative yeah. of the passion you have for what you're doing. I think. Oh yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Because, like I said before, I'm I'm shocked and surprised that this stuff. I can continue writing because I don't know where it's coming from. It just, 
I hear something, I pick up my phone, lay down to put the idea down so I don't lose anything. I go up to my studio and I'll try to recreate what I put down just to get see how close I can get it. And if it's something, and I, I only work with like eight bars, that's it. Most of the time when I'm doing it, I'm, I'm a chorus thing to come up with me. So I'll, I'll lay that down. And if I can develop that eight bar chorus or whatever it is, to something that I think I can develop further, I, I'll go ahead and I'll start working on the verses and everything. But I'll do something like that and I'll let it sit for a day or two and then go back and check it out to make sure that, you know, I wasn't fooling myself. Sure, right, yeah, right. That's a piece of crap. Yeah. Delete. <laughs> I, I totally get it. And uh, a real trip was, so uh, when I did the, um, when I was doing the my Something Beautiful CD, mm. Um, one of the guys that I had uh, co-written the song with, I mean, the song was beautiful too, man. It was, it was so good. And I had, I had all the stuff done for my record and went, wow, this is going to be great. But for some reason, uh, sometimes people, they, uh, uh, once they see that as a possibility for some money to start being involved, then they start getting a little weird. <clears throat> so this guy, I'd been working with him. He lives down in Palo Alto. He called me to do some sessions for him. Um, I went down and I did a few vocal sessions for him. And then he says, man, he says, you know, we should write something together sometime. And I was working with this guy for probably about five years. I said, sure, man, no problem. I said, I said he said, I'll tell you what. He said, I'll, I'll come up with some ideas and I'd come on down. You can sit and listen to see what, what, what hits you. So I go down there and this, this one particular song, I said, that vibe right there, it, will definitely work so we worked on this thing we developed it the song came out i mean it was unbelievable man <clears throat> and he was going back and forth to la so he went down there and he had some had some strings strings put on the thing i mean everything was killing and uh we had had discussions about you know doing that stuff i said hey man you know what you know we write stuff when when the stuff has to be paid for we just split everything evenly no problem sure so come time to I call him, I said, Hey man, you know what? I'm I'm getting ready to put the uh, put the I take the uh, to send the C D to get it mastered. I need to have have the um you know tune so I can send that because I want everything to be mastered together. So sure. you so you have that con continuity. Yeah, you know? of course. Yeah, you can't have one track mastered by exactly. somebody. Else. Yeah, it's yeah. So he says, uh, well, you know, I already got this one this one mastered and all that. And he said, Man, you should really check this guy out that um that I'm using to master a lot of stuff. I said, okay, let me check it out. And you know, it was good, but I had somebody else in mind that had done uh, previous CDs of mine and I wanted this cat to get a shot, you know, cause I didn't even know this other guy that he pulled up. So uh, he said, well, we, before we do that, you know, anyway, uh, uh, we need, we, we need to talk. And he says, he says, and, um, and I, I got, I got, a, I got this manager now and I'd like for you to talk to him. I was like, Mm. When the hell did you get a manager? I said, I've been knowing you for five years. We've been working together. And now you want me to talk to somebody else? He says, yeah. He said, here's his number. I said, I'm not calling anybody. I said, you you want me to speak to this guy? You haven't called me. So, you know, right then I'm, I'm like, I, I, this is not going to work. Yeah, so it's, manager, everything's bad. Yeah. Manager calls me the next day. And he says, okay, he says, well, he says, this is it. You know, we, I've had talk with my client and, uh, you know, he, he wants this and that. And then, uh, you know, he's paid for this. I said, you know what? I told him right from the beginning, we had this discussion that any monies that were spent on this tune, we split it evenly. I said, in fact, yesterday when me and him were having this conversation, I happened to be at my bank and I told him, I said, look, I'm here at the bank right now. I, I can withdraw the withdraw the money out for for my half and and then I found out that there was another guy that he had pulled in that had done some uh some uh, drum stuff and all that that he had come become a, a, a part writer too and I told him I said well that's fine too I said but if I'm putting in uh money on this he's better be put he better be putting a third of this so sure. we the cost three ways so and then that's when he says about you know talking to his uh uh manager that he hired again too and his manager brings this up i said well i told him yesterday 
that I would take the money out and take, I could even drive it down to him because Palo Alto ain't but, but 15, 20 minutes down the road from me, take it down to him. So then he starts, well, he also wants to have this and this. And I said, you know what? Let's just stop right there. I said, this, this ain't going to work. So since you're, since you're his mouthpiece. You yeah. That's him. such a turnoff, man. Yeah. It's such a turnoff. Like someone you got a relationship with and now you're talking to his bitch or something like that. Well, I don't even know who this dude is. I said, since you're his mouthpiece, yeah, you tell him that you and him can take the tune and <laughs> shove it up your ass because it ain't going to be on my record. Yeah. <laughs> Just forget it. And I already know any, any, any relationship that you, you go into with a cat, if it ain't right from the beginning, it yeah. ain't going to get no better. Yeah, if so the honeymoon I, isn't happening, man. It, it, yeah. Well, that, that pissed me off too because this that tune, oh man, that tune was it was it was it was different from everything else that I had on the something beautiful CD, but it it was a perfect fit. And the the, the recording, every everything we did on there was just magnificent. Well, even if you up, both released it on a record, what would have been? The, I mean, you know, yeah. like wh why was he being such a dick after all the work you did together? You catch it like that. I, I'd rather not do the song. And I told him, I said, you know what? If you release this song, you better let me know in advance. I said, because if you don't let me know in advance and you put it out, I'm going to take you to court. He said, because, you know, you, you, we were supposed to do this thing. So anyway, what that led to was like, I, I, there was a certain amount of tunes that I wanted on, on this something beautiful CD. So, uh, I started, uh, I was riding home one night from a gig and I went, man, I need to come up with another tune. So I figured uh, maybe I would just try to write another one. And then I started thinking, I went, wait a minute. I pulled the car over and I pulled my phone out and I said, you know, I'm putting all these little sketchy ideas down for tunes and stuff. I said, let me check out some stuff and see what, uh, see what I got. Craig, man, I, I opened up the, uh, the voice memo file and I kept scrolling, 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 scrolling. I scrolled back to 2002 with ideas that I had on. No. My... That's, you know what? That's First of all, years ago, holy crap. I came up with an, uh, uh, the, the final tune that's on. Matter of fact, it's the last song on the Something Beautiful CD. That's, that's the tune that, that I came up with for that. For that. And Pull with that this up. new CD that, I, the CD that I'm doing now, all the ideas from those voice memos that I had, I ended up, so when the pandemic happened, my, my last gig was on March 13th. So from that time up until a month and a half ago, I had 10, wrote 10 tunes for my, for my new record. Man, that's, that's great. So you've been and super productive. And they all came from them voice memos that I have on my phone. That's crazy. So the last, that tune you wrote was uh, Against All Odds. Against all odds. Yeah, man, that's a nice song. Wow. Man, I, I and, hear stories like this all the time. Oh, yeah. I, and then I end up getting a call yeah. from, from the guy that, you know, bailed out mm -hmm. that I had to, to cut. He ended up calling and apologizing to me like a year later because he, oh, man, you know, I never should have listened. I said, you know what? I said, let me tell you something, man. I said, I've been in this business a long time and worked with a lot of people. I said, you're trying to blame this guy that you hired to speak for you. I know for a fact that anything that he said to me, it came from you. Of course. So why are you trying to, you know, uh, blame this on him? You're the one that told him to, to, to say these things. I said, so you know what? It's your fault that this thing fell apart, not his. Good for he you, said, man. Oh, well, you know, I really I like to work with you. I said, you can, I'll work with you. I said, but you know what it's going to be? We, I ain't ever writing a song with you again. Yeah. That's, you can forget about that. Yeah. So if you want me to do uh, recording sessions for you, I'm glad to do it. But you're going to pay me to do the sessions. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's my involvement with you. It's, 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 it's all about the money now. I'm not doing any. I ain't writing no songs with you anymore. Well, we you can't go back that. for a second round of that, man. No. There's this, no. I said, and it's a damn shame. I said, because you just wasted a really good song. Yeah. This song was a freaking smash, man. I said, but you know what? That song is dead to me now. I had to do that, I had, <laughs> that, I had to do that with another guy, man. Yeah. There was this guy that uh, uh, back be before I got to Santana gig. Matter of fact, me and him wrote this song that's on the Whispers uh, record. Okay. 
the, the Whisper CD called More of the Night. We wrote this tune called uh, Don't Be Late for Love. Great tune. Matter of fact, they, they were fighting for it at uh, Capitol Records between the Whispers and Peebo Bryson. So the record company calls me, Capitol calls me and says, hey man, we got two of our artists that want to do this song, but you're going to have to be the one to choose which one you want to do the song. I said, oh, definitely the Whispers. Are you kidding me? As much as I like Peebo Bryson, the Whispers are like, you know, that's one of my favorite groups. So I had to cut ties with that guy too, because this dummy, we agreed the whisper is going to do it. We work out the agreement and everything with Capitol Records. He calls the record company about three weeks before they're getting ready to release the uh, whispers record. Hey, um, yeah, this is uh, so-and-so and you know, uh, uh, I want to, uh, uh, renegotiate some of the stuff we did on the contract uh, with the whispers. I don't, I think they're trying to take advantage of with the record. So the, I get calls, I get a call from one of the lawyers at, at Capitol Records. And he says, your partner called here and you know, we're about to put this record out and we're about to snatch this record, your song off of there. If, if you can't uh, uh, work this out and talk to him, he said, because you know, we're putting this record out and then we'll just replace it with something else. And you didn't know any of this was going on. Didn't know it was going Correct. on. Yeah. He's getting ready to get us blackballed. That's what he was getting ready to do. I called him and I, I cursed him out, man. And I said, you know what? We're done. And the thing that pisses me off about that, we had a long catalog list of songs that we had. So all of those songs are dead to me too. So from, from those, that point on, I was working with cats like that. It, it kind of made me a little reluctant to collaborate, about, uh, uh, working with cats and writing. So I, that's why I got my own place set up and I got a, 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 a song that I might put on this new uh, record that one of them is probably, is probably going to be a, um, a cover. I'm thinking about doing that because it came out really good. And the other one I, I wrote with a couple other guys, but I'm, I love the tune, but you know, that skepticism is it pops up every now and then because I don't want to go through that again, man. It's like, it's a yeah. lot of time wasted, man. Yeah. It's as soon a as lot you get of ready to release something. Then they're going to start this crap. It's like, come on, man. Could work this stuff out easy. It's funny in both those situations, it was because something good was going to happen, and something good did happen. Yeah, <laughs> a, a guy told me I don't remember who it was. I wish that he said bands never fight when they're starving. He goes, when something good happens, then the bands start that's fighting. It and it, that's so true, man. Yeah, so true. Well, they got that. Um, what's the what's the name of that show that they have on cable TV? where they do the, uh, I can't think of the name of it now, but they, they, um, they do all these R and B groups and all this kind of stuff. They do like a documentary on, uh, on all these groups. Um, I can't think of the name and it. it's a great show too, but it's the same scenario every time. It's either once the group gets the popularity, either one of three things happens. Either it, Somebody starts to be a drug addict and screw right. things up. <laughs> Either somebody in the group gets a big head and thinks that he don't need the rest of them. Right. And he go on and do his own thing and that fails. Or the record company intervenes and they go, you know what? So-and-so is the, is, is the one that's the main focus in this group. So we want him to do all the lead singing or whatever happened. And then th those three scenarios always happen. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same thing. Right. You can watch it and you already know what the end result is going to be in all yeah. of these. What is the name of that? Uh, Unsung. Is oh, I don't know that. I don't, I don't watch oh, this man, TV. Sorry, man. I'm going to have to look at that. Yeah, it's called Unsung. And man, I mean, it. all these groups, they do all these documentaries on them and then you can see, you can see what's getting ready to happen at the end of it. Somebody's a drug addict. Somebody gets a big head. And they want to be, or the record company screws it up. Yeah, man. That's that's the three stories I hear when people come yeah. to the show. Um, Tony, what would you say the top three musical experiences you've had? Just oh, knee-jerk wow. reaction. I know it's tough. Well, the number one has got to be Santana thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, every night, man, out there performing in front of all those people and all that and, you know, the supernatural thing was, was freaking huge. Yeah. You know, I mean, sitting, you know, sitting at the Grammy awards, 
That was the first and only time that I ever been to the Grammys is when we won those. And, you know, when you, when you go there and you're sitting like right in the first three rows and you got all these big stars, you got Whitney Houston and Britney Spears and, and, and uh, Bobby Brown and you got uh, uh, Jennifer Lopez. You got all these people like sitting like right there. You can just reach back and touch. I mean, it was it like was, surreal. It was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, That's cool, but, man. Glad you got to experience that, man. Yeah, That's I mean, great. it's. Uh, That's and, cool. and another great one too was, um, you know, when they uh, uh, watching the whispers on Soul Train when uh, when when the record came more of the night when they came out, and and Don Don Cornelius is interviewing these guys. And he's talking and he says, because they did, they did my song on, on Soul Train. Okay. Oh, did, wow. Yeah. And they're talking and they said, well, you know, we really thank Tony Lindsay for, you know, bringing this. They actually mentioned my name. My, my mother called me and said, I just heard them mention your name on Soul Train. That's cool, man, that your mom got to see that. That is really cool. Well, she got to, she got to see quite a few Santana shows. As a matter of fact, uh, my mom, she's, got, she's gone now. But her and, Sorry, and, and Carlos, yeah, her and Carlos Santana's birthday is the same day. Oh, that's wild! July twenty first, and they they were really good friends, man. She was talking to him all the time, like he like he was one of her sons. Matter of fact, she told him, "You're gonna be a preacher one day." <laughs> so I make sure I make sure that I contact him on his birthday every year. You know, you know, yeah. we, we still, yeah, I, we, I'm, I mean, I'm cool. He's cool with me, and I'm pretty sure I'm cool with him too. Yeah. You know, people make changes because they just everybody's something's going to change anytime man i never ask anybody what happened because it's just the nature of the beast yeah. man it's like especially in the music business man people do that's right things change you know they want a different sound whatever you know it's yeah. just, and i always i always thank them because you know it, a lot of great things happen for me because of my association with the santana oh hell yeah you know and i i i i definitely make sure that I let him know that all the time. And I contact him on his birthday and he always hits me right back immediately. That's cool, yeah. man. Number three, Santana and the Grammys whispers playing your song on soul train will be the number three. Oh man. And, and then mentioning my name. That is so good. Oh, yeah. Scotty and Walter, man, the lead singers from whispers. Matter of fact, I just got a call from them a couple of days ago. Get out. Cause they, they heard all is one. He went, man, did you write that song? I said, yes, we did. Oh, that is cool, man. He said, man, he's because Scotty said, man, I knew that was you after I, after I heard you sing the first couple lines. He said, that's Tony Lindsay. <laughs> that's cool, man. That's a nice compliment. Yeah. Yeah, that feels good. You know, you, you always know you got a, a, a good song when you start getting your, your, uh, your buddies, musicians, friends calling you and going, dude. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's and nice. I, man. I've been getting a call from quite a few folks about this one. That's and great. We just shot a uh, just shot a music video on this past Friday. I, is that the one that's up there? It's, it's the the no, guy's the one, voice is well. Like, the one that's up there is the the, the radio and marketing people that um that I signed up with. They're the ones that put that together. He's themselves. got a great voice. That it's like an old school DJ, like yeah. you know, a really good yeah. voice. That's Chris Clay, man. Yeah, he's got a good voice, man. So we just shot one in Oakland. Um, uh, Peter Peter Michael Escovito is the one who did the. Uh, 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 he was the the uh, producer of the, the video. So he just we just shot it on Friday. I'm I'm waiting to see his editing. You know, we did the green screen thing. You know, so right. You know, because we got we got to be COVID sensitive right now. So we we brought yeah. one person in at a time. So we didn't have a whole bunch of people in the studio and people crossing each other. So I'm, God, I'm really, gotta be in production, man. Oh yeah, I'm really uh, curious in how how it turned out. This guy does great work. He, his sister Sheila, he he shoots all of her videos. Oh, that's wild. And and his dad, Pete Escovito. Yeah, he he shoots. I thought all I of knew them. that guy's name. I thought I knew that name. Uh, man, what was what were some of the low points or or dark periods you had to deal with, and how'd you get through them? Um, well, you know what, man, it's it's a funny thing. You. Every time that I, you know, uh, that I wasn't in the Santana band, that it kind of it, it would sting for a couple of days. But but I'm I'm one of those kind of people. I don't I don't wallow in no uh, in no grief too long. I I can't do that. You know that's that that's uh, 
that takes me in the wrong direction. I'm a real positive person and I, I, I like uh, neg negativity. I can't, I can't hang with that too long. You know, so I don't, uh, I'll sit around for maybe a day or so, but then it's like, okay, you know what? I, I, I got to keep moving, moving forward. I can't, I can't sit in this. So those, those dark days don't last long for me. That's great, man. Hey man, life is too short. Ain't that the truth, brother. And, and with, with this COVID and, and, and uh, our, our environment being all screwed up, you know, it's even shorter than we think. So, you know, what, whatever you're going to do, you better get on with it. <laughs> no, I get agree on with, with it now. Yeah. Uh, anything that you, one or two things you might've done, which at the time were out of your comfort zone, but you did them anyway. And it was a, try not to be a good thing. Hmm. Wow. That's a good question. Out of my comfort zone. Man, I can't I can't think of many things that I've done that were were outside of the comfort zone. Yeah, you seem like you're real uh you, yeah. you have like nothing you're ready for stuff. It's it, even if it is, it's not. Like, you know, like you're just ready for the yeah. challenge, man. That's really cool. Well, you know, yeah, because you know I I tell you, stuff that did happen which which actually forced me to learn to uh, uh do a lot of jazz. Uh there was this club in San Francisco. Um, and what, what the, the owner used to do is he would call musicians, and say, Hey, you know, are, are you available this week? You know, da, da. so you, you, you didn't actually have a, a band that you had that went in, he would call different people, you know, and, and have them show up and you would play together, which was actually kind of a cool idea. Yeah. So some nights I would go and do the gig and there would be uh, a cast that I know, uh, you know, all we can, so we can do our R and B stuff all night, you know, cause that was their, that was it. And then some nights I'd go there and it would be these freaking heavy jazz cats. And I'm like, Oh shit, what am I going to do? <laughs> so it forced me to learn a lot of jazz stuff, which was actually cool. So for after years and years of doing that stuff, you know, now I'm, I'm able to do just about any type of gig. Like I tell, um, uh, since the uh, uh, pandemic has hit and a lot of people are doing live streaming stuff and all that, but you know, you can't you do a lot of live streaming with a lot of people in, 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 in an enclosed area. Sure. So, you know, I told people, I said, Hey, you know what? If, if you need a duo, a trio, if you need a, 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 a quintet, a quartet or whatever, or even a big band, I said, I can do all of that stuff. So I've, I've been doing uh, live stream, uh, 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 performances with just me and a piano player. I could do it with just me and a guitar player if necessary. Right. I got this uh, a little power trio that I got with uh, uh, my friend Janice Maxie Reed, who she plays, this chick is so bad. She plays keyboards and she kicks bass. And you don't even know it's not a bass player on, on stage with her. Oh, she, she just kicks pedals? And she sings her tail off. Oh, wow. That's so me, tail. her, and a drummer, Design Claiborne, we do a lot of trio gigs together. All right. You know, so I can, any configuration I can do. So That's cool. uh, I can, I can work all the time. It's, it's no problem with me. That's great. Well, you made it that way, man. You know, yeah. you, you know, you set it up like that. You, you yeah. adapted and made things work so you could do that. It just didn't happen, man. And it's, and it's because I just wasn't afraid to, to go mm -hmm. on and, and venture into it, you know? So, uh, I, I've been, uh, I don't, I don't have too many uncomfortable situations. Thank God. Thank God, man. That's good. Any singers who influenced you that people might be surprised to hear? Ooh, yeah, man. Uh, Donnie Hathaway is my number one cat. You know, him, uh, Teddy Pendergrass, of course. Uh, 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 Billy Paul was another one. Billy Paul. I haven't heard that name in a long time. You know what I'm man. saying? Yeah. 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 Of um, course. Uh, uh, who else is on that list? Marvin Gaye. Yeah. You know, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughn, you know, Nat King Cole. I mean, I got a whole bunch of yeah. them. And then there's a cat here in the Bay Area. This cat named Kenny Washington. This dude, the jazz singer, I'm going to tell you right now. He he's up on that level with uh, the Bobby McFerrins and all those kind of. Matter of fact, he 
he's been working a lot with uh, with uh, Wynton Marcellus lately. Oh wow, Kenny man, he's got a, he's got a new CD out now, right now too. Kenny Washington. This dude can sing like you won't believe, man. It's funny, yeah. man. There's a Kenny Washington in New York who's a badass drummer. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. It's funny. Uh, but I got I, I got the influences that come from a lot of different places, man. It's like you know, because I just I, I listened to coming up, man. I I was exposed to so, especially a lot of the R and B stuff, you know, with all those old singing groups and stuff. It's like, but but Donny Hathaway, man, when you hear that guy's voice. Yeah, he's pretty incredible, man. And his daughter sounds just like Layla. She sounds just like him. I have talked to a lot of people that have played with her, man. Yeah. yeah. She does this thing to where she can she can sing and hit three harmonizing notes coming out of her voice at one time. How do you do that? <laughs> I have no idea, man. I There's this weird play. thing she does and she'll hit it and you hear you hear three notes in harmony with each other. That's pretty amazing, man. That's that's a God given gift, man. That's not. I don't know anybody else that can do that. Nobody. First first album you ever bought, you remember that? Whoa. No, I don't. God, I don't remember that at all. I got a lot of. I still got a lot of vinyl here too. Well, tell me your top three Desert Island discs then, just for now, because that could change. Well, I know at one time I was a huge Teddy Pendergrass fan, mm -hmm. you know, because he just drove women crazy, man, when he started singing. So it was like, yeah, <laughs> he did. That was his thing, man. So I had a lot of, and, and you know, back when we were, you know, when we were buying vinyl, when they had, uh, um, what was the, uh, uh, I don't know if they had that record store. What was the name they had right here? I forgot. The Tower? Name. Tower Records. Yeah, Tower. Man, I would be at Tower Records. I'd go there once a month and buy probably six or seven new records at a time. Oh, yeah. Sure, man. You know? So I, I got the all these thing. vinyl records out. In, uh, but, you know, I, I got a whole bunch of them. And back in the college days, too, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire stuff and all that, man. Ooh. You know, all those early records? Yep. That stuff still sounds great. Sure does. What's the best decision you ever made? Moving to California. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that. Oh, hell yeah. There was no, <laughs> I, I've never regretted that move ever. Are you good with like uh, balancing your time between work and, you know, family, friends stuff? Oh yeah. Yeah. How There's do you no do that? With. It's so hard. <laughs> well, you know, with, um, cause we're doing, I was doing a lot of traveling before. And um, the cool thing about the Santana band too was Carlos, cause every, all of us had families. So they would balance it out. If we, if we went out for three weeks, then we would come home for three weeks. That oh, kind wow. Of thing. That's how they always balance it out. So it always worked out. And, you know, my son uh, used to play ice hockey. Mm. So I got to I got to experience a lot of that kind of stuff with him because, you know, I mean, I was gone a lot, sure. but I was also home a lot, too, to be able to go on the uh, – because he was on a traveling team. Oh, that's a lot of work, man, for them kids. Yeah, so they, they were going – we were going up to Canada and – that's a and lot of on these other places. He had frequent flyer miles, man. And hockey's expensive, man. Hockey's in, like the most expensive sport, I think. Yeah, especially in California. Yeah. You know, they used to laugh at us in Canada because up there, you know, those guys go out in the backyard and spray a bunch of water out there and they got a hockey rink in their backyard. Yeah. You know, yeah. they didn't have to spend money on that. But down here, you know, you yeah. would spend just for registration, you have like 1500 bucks. Yeah. Then you'd have to buy all the equipment that he had to play in and, and and if you if you had to travel somewhere, you had all those hotel expenses and and plane fare and yeah. you know all that stuff was always happening, man. So it was, you know, just for ice time here in California, they charge you a ton of money. Yeah. But hey, you know what? Parents will pay anything for their kids. Yeah, of course, man. We did the same. And thing. we always knew where he was. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what do you like uh, most about yourself, Tony? Just, just being able to get along with people and, you know, you know, I, I, I try not to be a jerk, man. And I try to help people out a lot if they, if they need my assistance and, you know, I, I, I've done well for myself. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, help folks out. And I tell them all the time, Hey, you know what, 
if you want to give me something, that's fine. But if you if it's gonna if it's gonna hurt your bank or break it, you know, don't worry about it. Yeah. You know, because we all we all have have gotten uh, uh, different places and and our career has been helped by some people doing us favors and stuff. So you know yeah. what? If we don't help each other out, then how is it going to get done? But you know, I I just try to, you know trying to make, maintain good standing with people, man. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of cats out there that have a lot of talent, but you hate to work with them because they're a jerk. <laughs> yeah, man. That's awful. Yeah. That's awful. man. You know, it, people don't under, don't realize that, uh, more than half the battle of you getting work is if anybody can get along with you. I hear that all the time. If you got, if you got some decent talent, but you're a great person to work with, you're going to get the job. Right. If you got all the talent in the world, but you're a pain in the ass. Ain't nobody calling you. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. One of my one of my buddies, Fred Ross, always had this saying: "If your phone is not ringing, that's me calling." <laughs> <laughs> if your phone's not ringing, that's me. That's calling. me calling. <laughs> that's great, man. <laughs> hey, tell me something or someone that you miss from your childhood. Well, my mom's gone. My dad, my dad too. My dad died when uh, I was just turning 18. Oh, that's which young. Was probably, which was probably one of the big reasons why I uh, things you, you booked. Uh, yeah, every everything started changing in my head when my when my dad passed. Oh man! I'm like, you know what? I think I'm gonna have to do things a little bit different than everybody else. But you know, my parents, man. I used, I used to talk to my mom all the time. It didn't, it didn't matter where I was at in the world. I made sure I talked to her, called her at least three or four times a week, you know, and, and we would talk about everything, man, all kinds of stuff. You know, That's I missed, great, I missed man. that. And I got yeah. a lot of, I got a lot of really good friends that had passed away. My buddy Elliot Lewis died at an early age. You know, he was a, uh, you know, big part of my life. My buddy, Tony Cachetti, he's gone, you know, so we got, I got all these, all these cats, but you know, mostly relatives. My cousin Bruce, because he he was brutally murdered. You know, Jeez, sorry, man. Oh. Yeah, we got a lot of that stuff. Where's that? Yeah, back, everybody, in, back in Kingston. Yeah. Oh man. And everybody sorry. has those stories. You know, that's why when uh, everybody people does. always ask me when I'm uh, writing writing music, and uh, I tell people when I write, I try to write things in in in. It takes a lot, you know. I, I think about my lyrics, and I, I'm editing all the time because whatever I'm saying, I want it to fit the general public. Because we're all human beings, we all have the same experiences and go through everything. So you know, stuff that I go through, hey, the person next door to me has probably gone through that too. You know, I don't. You, you got your heart broken. You ain't the first person in the world yeah, that had man. your heart broken. So when you write and try to focus on it being fitting, fitting everybody. That's how the songs last. And well, uh, that's how you connect, man. That's it. That's how you connect. Happiest, happiest moment or happiest time in your life? Wow, my son being born. That's nice. That was probably the best achievement. Thank, <laughs> thank, thanks to my wife. Had a son for me. You know, we can't, you, it, nothing gets any better than that. That's nice, man. Matter of fact, we were just hanging out yesterday because my birthday was yesterday. That's right, thirty-five. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you think I think about it though all the time, and I ask people all the time, you know, because they go, "Oh, damn, twenty-five. I always say, "Would you want to be that age again?" Especially today, hell no. Oh, what you know now, all the stuff. You would you want to be that age again? No, it, it's I feel funny. Really bad. You know, my younger. We have three kids. My younger son, so he's our middle child, was talking about, you know, he's 28. This is supposed to be the best years of your life. I said, and it's just not happening. I said, listen, that's bullshit. Yep. As the best years of your life are now, like now, like in your late 40s, 50s, and above. It's because you got less responsibility. You give a shit less about stuff. You feel better about yourself. I said, that's a lie that was manufactured to sell you shit or something. But oh, yeah. it's tough when you're young. I said, it's tough. Hey, man, it was, you know, I, I, and, and until I turned 36, I don't, I don't think anybody even took me serious. You know, yeah. once you turn 36, they kind of, okay, you're a man now. Yeah. But now that I'm 66, <laughs> I'm, I'm to that point. And 
where I, I, I feel that I can say whatever I want to say because I've earned that right. Yes. And if you don't like it, tough. Yes. And I got a lot of cats that I say stuff in front of and they look at me like, I'm like, hey, man, you know, that's just the way I feel right now. Sorry. You know, but you know what? When you said that to that guy, when, when, when you said to him, when he said, um, my manager, blah, 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 you right, know, right. I listen to him. I was really, I thought that was cool that you called him on that, that you said, hey, man, that wasn't your manager. Your manager's carrying out your wishes. That's right. It comes you from know. the top. Yeah, man, of course. You know, that was bullshit. Top. I hate that one. Well, you know, this guy, come on, man, don't do that. Just like every, a, everybody, that's not even a real apology. Yeah, you everybody know? does that. If everybody that has a team of people that work with them, they all do that. You, your instructions come from the top. Well, man, save your money and just do the right thing on your own. Yeah. Screw that shit, man. I've never had a manager. Yeah, that's another thing that cracked me up. This guy was like, it sounded like he was not manager caliber, and all of a sudden no. he's got a manager. It's like. Well, you know what? The, it, it, the weird part is, 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 especially after you've been around uh, somebody for a while and they start doing that kind of stuff. So now, <laughs> long, long before this, him and his wife is split up. And he was blaming all this kind of stuff and everything on her. And I'm looking at him. I'm going, no, dude. You know what? Now it was you know. your fault while she why why she split because yeah. you know what? If you're gonna handle stuff like like this with me, I know you probably did. And and then talking to another friend of mine who works with him, she said the same thing. Yeah, man. Said, how yeah. you do one thing is how you do everything, yeah. pretty much. Man. His wife split on him because he's a freaking jerk. <laughs> yeah, man. Better him than you. Uh this is a good question. Has your life been different? than what you'd imagined. Yeah, I have to say that. You know, because e even when you, you, we have these dreams of, you know, this is what you want to do with your life. We, we, we dream that, but when, when it starts to happen, you know, that's a whole different thing because a lot of people have dreams of what their life, what they like their life to be like and, and they never get there, you right. know? Now I not only got there, but I even went, I even went further with a lot of stuff, you know? So awesome. it's like, you know, I, I pinch myself on a lot of this stuff. And you know, the, the big thing for me too, is, and I, I tell a lot of family members too, you know, it's, this is not only for me, it's for you. You know what? If you need to use my name or whatever, something that if you, if you're trying to achieve something, use my name, just don't be using it in, 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 in any uh, negative crap. Sure. So don't, don't be attaching me to that kind of thing because I, I don't do that. Right. I don't play that negative game. I said, but if you're, if you're doing something positive and you want to use me as a reference or go for it. Yeah. Kidding. That's and cool. even now, you know, I started thinking about it and uh, you know, when we're advertising a lot of stuff and the people go in and they'll, they'll, they'll pull pictures out and they have all these photos and, with me and Santana and all that. I said, you know what? It, it's cool to use some of that stuff, but I, I want to kind of be careful in doing that because first totally. of all, yeah, I, get I don't know, you know, they, they're not going to say any, anything to me about it, but I don't even want to even get that close to what they say. I said, plus the other thing is I don't want to be giving people the wrong impression because a lot of times you put a lot of photos on something uh, and say, I got a new record coming out. I'm doing a show and you put these photos up with me and Santana. They might think that he's going to be there. Right. Or part of the record. Right. He said, no, I, I, you know, we don't, we don't need that. I said, so just be careful on how we do that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, so I it's think been, that's it's smart. Been yeah. No, oh, I think that's smart, man. But you know what I say? I'm going to use some of that stuff because you heard I it. it for 25 years and they can't take that away from me. Yeah. Yeah. We got proof that I was there. Yeah, of course. <laughs> we got plenty of it. You I know. think that's smart, man. Yeah. Oh yeah, you you use the stuff, but you gotta you you gotta be sensible and reasonable with it. You know, don't be plastering his pictures and stuff all over the place because you gotta get permission from him to be doing that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, if you use one or two, then you know, he's not gonna say anything. Correct. If your whole campaign is based on pictures of you yeah. and him, it's not cool. Yeah, I get that, man. That's smart. Hey, do you have any hobbies uh, or interests outside of music? Oh yeah. Well, one of my hobbies was uh, basketball until I got the torn meniscus. So, you know, I've been, uh, yeah, I've been playing hoop, man, all the years at torn meniscus. So I had to have surgery on my knee. I had the first surgery was back in December last year. And then they had to go back in 
in uh, May of this this year, and because I had a lot of scar tissue, so they had to go back in and get all that out and manipulate the. So now my hobby is swimming. I love swimming, man. Oh, that's cool. It's, it's killing me because the pools and everything is shut down because I was swimming every day. Oh shit, that's right. Yeah, man, and it's killing me right now. Now, now they're, sl- they're slowly starting to open things back up, but they haven't opened the pool yet. I'm like, wait a minute. Here you got these gyms open. People in there, you're, you're in a room where they're all breathing the same air pretty much. Yeah. They're touching the machines, but the pool has got all this chlorine in it that's going to kill anything that gets in it, and we can't use the pool. <laughs> Here they have it, like, in, the, in my gym, they have a pool, but it's like social distance. Like, it's only two or three people in the whole pool at once, and then, the, you know, yeah. they have the lanes cut off or something like that. And, and they had, they had the, the, at the, because I remember the YMCA, so they had mm-hmm. it. They had it, you know, mapped out good. You had to, you had to schedule the time. Right. They only let a certain amount of people in, and you, you can't take any showers at the, uh, at the Y. You can use the locker room to change, but once you did that, you had to, you go out one way. You got to wear your mask out into the pool area. You go in. They got a shower running that you can't touch. Take your shower, get your mask off, get in the water. You're not standing in near anybody once you get right. in. And when you leave, you go out a different way go to the locker room, change your stuff. And then you go out, go out the back door. So you're not passing anybody. Oh, that's smart. So they had, they had it all down really good, but why they didn't open the pool up yet. And when, and the minute they do, I'm going to be there, man. I miss, I miss the swimming. It's been about a month now, yeah, but I work tough. out at home. So, but it's not the same. Hey, uh, Tony's got one of his Grammys, man. Yeah. This is the one, uh, with uh, Rob Thomas, smooth for smooth. That's so cool, man. Is that heavy? Yeah, a little bit. It's got some weight to it. Yeah. But see, got we got we, we got eight. Of them. Yeah, we got eight of these, and then on the bottom row is this three of uh, Latin Grammys. Okay. That was the the year that we won these. Is was was the first year that they had the Latin Grammy Awards. Man, do you know a guy named Benny Facconi? I don't think so. He's a uh, he did all the engineering for Mana. That's why I asked. I thought he's in. He's he was oh, he really? won. He won like one of the first Latin Grammys for engineering. Huh. He's in L.A. Yeah. I'm trying to think if he. Uh, I was just curious if he worked with Carlos. I'm wondering if he ever came to any of the shows. He must have. I'm sure. Yeah, he did a lot of work for them. That's so cool, man. Congratulations on that. That is nice. Oh yeah, it's it's funny as heck, man. Because uh, I did it couple of gigs down in uh, Texas with the school school district down there and uh, one of the uh, uh, supervisors or something down there said, hey, do you mind bringing one of the Grammys with you? I went, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, 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 no. <laughs> to bring a Grammy? <laughs> said, I'm not, I said, these things do not leave my house, man. Yeah, man, you can't put that in luggage. <laughs> Actually, this is the first time I've even taken one out of the case since they've That's been in really there. That's really cool. Thank you. That's cool, man. Yeah, man. Thanks, Tony. Hey, you've been all over the world. What's the favorite place you traveled? Oh, God. i got so many of them, man. I love Italy. I love Brazil. I mean, so many places in Europe is like, Europe is great, man. You know, the, the thing I love about Europe is just their, their appreciation for music. Is like, yeah. It's unbelievable. You, you, people that you think, you know, at one time they were stars and you think, ah, yeah, they're gone. Especially like guys like Boy George and all of them. Right. They're still famous and popular over there in the, in, in Europe. Yeah. I have a lot once of guys. Yeah. There. Once you're, once you're big, big over there, they, they, that never dies. Yeah. They have less of a, what have you done for me lately mentality. They just like exactly. the fact that you play good music and they appreciate it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and uh, I, I love it. They, they just, they show up. It could be freaking raining like crazy out there, man. And, you know, because a lot of their concerts and their shows are outside. They'll put on uh, this little raincoat thing, the one you and, and they'll come out and they'll stand in the mud. That's cool, man. So they're good, the ra- good fans. Yeah. Uh, three more questions, Tony. What is the... Uh, Toughest decision you had to make or most difficult thing you had to do? Hmm. Wow. Toughest decision. I haven't had many of those. 
That's great. I'm coming back as you. <laughs> because it's, 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 it's one of those things that, um, you know, I, I think about uh, a lot of stuff that I do. I think about it a long time because I just, I, I guess it's just the, I don't know if it's the astrological something, well, I don't know what it is, but I think about things a long time because I know when I do make that decision to make the move or whatever it is, it's going to be the right one. You know, and I haven't had many situations where I had to, I had to think about it. Uh, you know, tough decision. Uh, I can't remember having to make one of those. That's great. Uh, two more questions, man. What is the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? And how much of that change has been intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging? Hmm. I think I've been the same. Really? People look at me different now, you know, because it's always, it's always the folks around you that are the ones that think you've changed and you really haven't, you know, because if you have, if you have some success in your life, mm -hmm. then they think that automatically, and I, I feel like I'm the same person, you know? Oh yeah. I really do. Yeah. They look at me different. Interesting. You know? Yeah. I, so, had a, okay. I got a, I had a few of them that, you know, just because they see me doing, uh, you know, TV shows and I got records out and it was Santana. Yeah. They all think that I got so much freaking money that is just, you know, pour, pouring out of my ears. <laughs> they think I'm a millionaire or whatever. And they go, you know, I'm, I'm doing really well. I said, but I still got to work. Yeah. You know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing better than, than most people, but I still, I still have to work. I can't, sure just sit around and, and not do anything because I'll lose whatever I have. I'll lose it quick. So, you know, I think it's just the people that, you know, themselves to change. Cause you know, I, I, I think I'm still the same. I, I have to ask a few folks to see if, uh, it's funny you say that, man, because you, you're like such a, I look, I mean, we're just talking here, but I don't get any, any vibe out of you other than you're like pretty mellow, man. Like, like you're yeah, pretty, like, I don't, cause you don't come across as like difficult to please or like, yeah. you know, you got some weird shit going on or. Yeah. You know. None at all, man. You know what? I've been, <laughs> uh, I've been very fortunate. Yeah. My whole life. With, uh, you know, I told me and my cousin, we, we talk about a lot cause he, uh, one that was in the in the singing group with a four of a kind. We were yeah, he finally moved out from New York. He lives in Laguna down in Laguna Hills now. Oh, that's great, man. And we talk about our childhood all the time, man. You know, we see a, a lot of kids with all of these problems stuff. We never had that kind of stuff happen. That's great. I mean, we remember we remember all the details of our childhood. We we had we had a great time when we were kids. That's nice. Because we were always singing and and performing at other places. You know, we had people that were, were helping us out. We had a guy who passed uh, back a couple of years ago, Wayne, Wayne Anderson would teach us how to sing harmonies and stuff. He was in one of the, uh, the older, he was one of the older guys in the singing groups at uh, like the temptation kind of group. And they, so he would teach us how to sing harmonies and all that. We had people that, that helped us when we, uh, we were doing talent shows and stuff all the time. And we had our, uh, our, our black pants with cummerbunds and you know, white ruffle shirts with bow ties. Yeah. The little kids, That's we were funny. doing that kind of stuff. And people were supporting us and taking us around to, to do our shows and all that. We had so much fun when we were kids, man. None of us were getting out here, getting in trouble and doing crazy stuff. It and, sounds like you found your path, the right path. Yeah. Like whatever you were supposed to be doing, you got on that. Got on it. And never got early, on. man. Yeah, that sounds great. You know, and I'm continuing to do it. That's why I said, you know, now, I mean, I've been doing this all my life. Yeah. I'm still, I, oh, yeah, okay, I got these Grammys here. They don't have, not one of them has Tony Lindsay on there. Right on, man. You know, it's all of me being a part of a group. Sure. Which is a great thing because, you know, I'm, I got my stamp on that for my for the rest of my life. Sure. And even I, I look at a lot of the, um, the advertising and the, and the Santana video stuff that people are showing now. They're, still, they're showing stuff with me and Dennis Chambers and all of them in there all the time. Right. I don't see anything with the new group that he has. That's funny. Wow. Or a lot of the older groups. There's still there people say, man, I saw you on TV again yesterday. <laughs> That's cool, man. 
Well, it must have done. Well, I've been, uh, I, I've been very, really fortunate, man. I, you know, you know, my childhood was great. You know, my parents didn't get in the way. They just let me do because they, they knew where I was and yeah. what I was doing. So it was no problem. Last question, man. Most important lesson that life has taught you is to uh, just do unto others. You know, don't be because uh, if you if you do some crazy stuff to people, it, it is going to come back to you, man. Yeah, karma's a bitch. Just, just man. try to be nice with people and and help people out. That's that's what it's all. If we if we don't start taking care of each other, and we're going to be gone. I mean, look look at what unfortunately Amen. Amen, our man. generation has done to this environment, dude. And our kids and grandkids. I know. Or either going to not exist at all or got to try to clean up all that crap. And, you know, and I can't even, I can't even believe that we, we're even still arguing about that today. It's scary, man. That, so that really, particular is really scary. You don't believe the scientists when did Al Gore put that, that um, documentary out how long ago now? Talking yeah. about how we need to make a change in our environment and the way we handle things. Otherwise, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be destroyed. And how now we got... 10 years, maybe even less than that to fix this thing. I know. Otherwise, yeah. you can't reverse it. I think about that a lot, not for me, but for my kids and my granddaughter. That's right. I and, mean, you know, whatever other grandkids I can have, you know. And, you know, my son, him and his girlfriend, they just moved out like six months ago and, and, and bought their own place, you know. So at some point, they're going to be, you know, wanting to start a family. Sure. And, like, I don't have any grandchildren yet. And what 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 is this all going to do with my grandchildren? You know that the environment's going to be so messed up that it's going to screw up their lives. You know, and um, you know that's I, I'm a people person, man. I've always been. You know, I like performing. I like being around folks. You know, and, and at the same time, I'm a loner. I love being by myself too. Really? Oh yeah. I think you have to be to be a musician because you have to spend so much time working on your craft. And that's a lot of that is alone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm up, I I don't, I don't get a whole lot of sleep. You know, most of the time I'm, I'll get to bed, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning. Serious. Yeah. And by around eight 30, nine o'clock, my eyes open up. And this guy looks like really young. That's the secret. (laughs) Obviously I got to sleep less. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you know what this thing is, is, um, I just know I got to get stuff done. And, and if I, if I have something to do, mm. I really have a hard time sleeping then because something is in there going, Hey man, you got to get up. You know, you got to <laughs> crazy drives me crazy, but I don't like, uh, going to bed early. If I go to, if I go to bed at 11 o'clock, I'm going to wake up about two o'clock in the morning and I'm not going to be able to go back to sleep. Dude, that is the worst. It's horrible. Yeah. That happened to You're me. You're sitting there looking much. around the room. So I'd rather go to I'd rather go to bed around two thirty three o'clock in the morning. Then I know I'm going to sleep at least till nine. But Maybe one I'm thing having... for sure, huh. I gotta I gotta I gotta go to sleep while it's still dark. <laughs> if I look out there and I see some light coming up. I'm screwed. I know it's terrible, man. It's terrible. Well, hey, man, listen, I can't thank you enough for your time. You're a real sweet guy. I'm glad we got to connect. Let me tell people where they could find you. Okay. Uh, it's Tony Lindsay. It's L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. Uh, yeah. Tony's got a great website. It's TonyLindsay.com. Uh, I would love you to check out his new single called All Is One. And uh, it's also, like I said, it's working on the, uh, the indie hit list. Uh, his last record, Something Beautiful, really, yeah. really nice record. Uh, I love uh, my favorite song there was actually in my shoes. Um, I really, ah, like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was, I really like that song. And uh, but it's a great buddy, record. And he's my he's buddy got, Chris Kane is playing guitar on that one. Oh, is he? That's so yeah, funny. Man. Yeah, I know Chris is. Um, and also he has a jazz CD out with the Michael O'Neill Quintet, and uh, check that out. He's also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So follow him uh, and. Uh, like his pages there and you have a youtube channel yes and that, he's that on too. youtube subscribe to his youtube channel and also if you are interested in working with tony to have him do some tracks for you reach out to him his email is tony lind like his name it's t-o-n-y-l-i-n-d 
at AOL.com. Just give him some backing information, maybe a link yeah. to the music so he can figure out what's got going on and why do you think he's a fit? You know, just give him some info so oh. he can make an intelligent response and uh, I'm sure he'll get back with oh, you. By the way, the name of the uh, Michael Neal Quintet CD is called Pacific Standard Time. Pacific Standard Time. Awesome. So check that out. Uh, and uh, I'm telling you, I'm waiting for your children's book because I'd love you to get that Grammy. Man, the children's record, man. I'd like you to get that. You, you know what? It, it's like, and, and 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 I, I, when I when I think about it, you know, especially with dealing with the um, the, the record labels that have all that money, you know, it it would be nice to have a Grammy with my name on it. But what's more important to me is hearing my hearing my music blasted all over the radio station. Yeah, I know you like that. That's that's the ultimate thing right yeah. there for me right now. That's cool, man. Well, I wish you nothing but luck, man. I'd love you to hey, get man, a Grammy. And, uh, I appreciate it. I think uh, we got to call our buddy Ed Roth and thank him for hooking us up together. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you and keep doing what you're doing, man. You're a super cool guy. Nothing but uh, good health to you and your family. Hang on one second. Let me wrap this up and then we'll chat. Everybody, thank uh, Is there anything else you want to promote, by the way? Did I hit everything? Uh, anything no. I've, okay. Just anytime you want me to do this, just let me know. I will, man. You, I promise. Absolutely. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, Please share it on your social media channels with your friends. We appreciate your support. Check out Tony Lindsay's music. Again, All Is One is a new single. His website, TonyLindsay.com, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. Last record is Something Beautiful and Pacific Standard Time is the jazz CD he's on with the Michael O'Neill Quintet. And also, if you are interested in having him do tracks, it's Tony Lind, L-I-N-D, at AOL.com. And uh, most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Right on, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> be nice. Go play a guitar or sing your heart out and have fun. Until next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Tony, thank you so much, brother. You got it. Thanks, Greg. You got it.